Welcome to today's State of Consumer Technology and Durables webinar. In the next few hour, housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If a tool isn't appearing, click its icon on the toolbar at the bottom. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. There is also a speaker bio section where you can find out more about our speakers. We also welcome your feedback, so please do fill out our survey at the end of the webinar. If your session has additional breakouts, you will be prompted to join these after or during the webinar. Thank you. Welcome to today's State of Consumer Technology and Durables webinar. In the next hour, you'll hear the latest intelligence on supply, demand and consumer needs. And as always, this webinar will be recorded. You will receive an email with a link to the recording tomorrow. And now I hand over to today's presenters, my colleagues, Matthias Friedrich and Nevin Francis. Yeah, hi, nice to meet you. Um, my team is, uh, my name is Matthias Friedrichs. The area of expertise is um, everything around consumer. I'm working at GFK HQ in Nuremberg and I'm happy to guide you through some slides later on today. Hi, I'm Nevin Francis. I'm a tech and durables expert from the Global Strategic Insights team at GFK. And uh, yeah, I joined Matthias in discussing various parts of the tech and durables uh, industry dynamics. And with, uh, with, before we proceed, I'd like to just point out that the insights that we present today would be from the State of Consumer Tech and Durables report. And the report, as well as the webinar, would be available to you, as uh, Claudia already mentioned, in uh, uh, by tomorrow. And without further ado, I'd like to jump into the de developments and the major trends of the tech and durables industry. So how was the last year? And 2020, what a phenomenal year. We saw quite some resilience of the tech and durables industry and the industry performed phenomenally with 12% growth year on year versus the previous year, 2020, amassing 1.414 trillion um, in US dollars. Now, the pandemic and the stay at home trends kept fueling, uh, uh, continued to fuel and continues to fuel the overall growth. However, now we see visible deceleration. We see deceleration owing to many facts, which we'll explore in the course of this webinar. But because of this particular deceleration, what we see and what we forecast for the next year is a diminished growth rate. We expect the industry to grow by 2%, massing 1.449 trillion for the full year 2022. Now, what exactly is the reason for this is what we are going to explore next. But mind you, when I say that there is a deceleration, it's not an absolute decline, but rather a declined growth rate because comparisons against high baselines of 2020. And in absolute terms, the market would still continue to be growing versus a pre-pandemic state. So where exactly was this growth coming from? Stay at home, as I mentioned, be it work at home, entertain at home, eat at home, clean at home, all of this was driving growth. And we saw the panic purchases that were made for especially IT products. IT continued the tailwinds of growth from 2020 into 2021, where we saw a 14% growth for the IT sector. Major domestic appliances, which saw a slight decline after the initial growth uh, spike in 2020, registered very strong growth as soon as shops were open and people could touch and feel. Telecom, a major share provider uh, in the overall, um, overall tech and durables, rebounded with a 14% growth. And small appliances, which had phenomenal growth in 2020, continued to grow by another 7%. So, same was the case with consumer electronics and TV sales. But amidst all this growth story, there is a disparity. And that disparity is between the volume and value sales. On one end, you see value grow by 12%, and on the other, you see a volume grow by mere 1%. And that is something that has been long seen as a trend, and hence, we need to see how that evolves in the next few months and years. If you had to point out how this work progression was over a period of time, what we can see is there was a stark uplift in the first half of the year and a slowdown that was visible in the second half. 
it, the year started with a strong double digit growth of 30% in quarter one, but it only took three quarters for that to come to a state of decline. And again, let me remind you that this decline is only in terms of growth rate because of comparisons again, high baselines. This decline is actually uh, not in absolute terms, but, uh, but more so because tw by the latter end of 2020, shops had started closing, uh, opening up. And as a result, uh, the sales had started growing pretty strong as a result of all the at-home trends. Now, the volume part is something uh, we would see how we can mitigate in due course. And there are a multitude of reasons. Inflationary pressures resulting in higher manufacturing costs, inflation, uh, price increases, shortages, supply chain disruptions, and certain geopolitical tensions. Let's take a look at all of these aspects one by one. Now, uh, going to the first part, which is about raw materials and how the supply chains are affecting. There are three major aspects which is causing that particular, uh, uh, particular slum. One is there's fuel shortages. Two, there is disruptions in energy, food, and commodity markets. Three, there is supply chain effects. Crude oil, which is essential for transportation, grew by 56% in March 22 versus the same period in the previous year. Lithium, which is essential for batteries, and imagine so many smartphones and any battery-operated device, grew by a humongous 500%. Same thing with steel, aluminium, copper, which are essential for the plants as well as for housing materials of products. All of these products are actually growing in terms of average price. In terms of supply chain shortages, what we saw is especially in the te consumer tech and durables or IT specific industries, the, it, there was a weakened supply chain, which even led to semiconductor shortages. There were ship chip shortages. And by quarter four, it was so drastic that there was a significant delay in time between order and delivery. Even the IMF cited that certain uh, parts of it would trickle into 2022 and you'd see prolonged delays because of this. The lead time from, uh, for delivery between ports in China to ports in US uh, increased in lead time by 27 days in, by December 21, when in comparison to the previous year, December 20. It was not just limited to that. Even logistic networks were under pressure. Logistic container costs were through the roof, growing at 218%. And there are many reasons for that. It could be potentially Europe and uh, UK uh, political instability where, because of the Brexit conditions or a zero COVID uh, policy maintained in mainland China because of which certain ports were unav unavailable. All of this impacted and resulted in a shared increase in costs. Now, when we men uh, mention these, what are the trickling effects and how, how is that resulting into inflation? And that's exactly what I'd speak in the next one. What we see here is the percentage point increase in the inflation forecast from OECD. OECD revised its inflation forecast and uh, with an upward revision of 4.4% in just a span of six months. And that's even visible in the panel market that we see at JFK. When looking at the average sales price of products across various months, and right now standing in Jan, uh, looking at figures coming in already in Jan of 2022, and benchmarking it to the prices that was visible in Jan of 2020, we are already seeing an increase of 23%. And this is just not a one-off. You see it is sustained over a period of time, as you see from 13 to 29 to 23. You see certain dips in the month of December. However, those dips are only, uh, are only momentary. And uh, what you see uh, in, as a part of those dips is only because of the promotional seasonality uh, in December. Now, when speaking about price increases, let's take some concrete examples. And that's exactly what I'm going to point out here. We have two particular categories from consumer electronics and small domestic appliances, the televisions and robot vacuum cleaners. I'd like you to first focus on the solid lines, which is the average sales price of those respective products. And the dotted lines are the average sales price of the products launched only in the year 2020. And the dashed lines are the average sales price of the products launched in 2021. Now, just visually, it is quite evident that the average sales price of the products in the years 2020 was already at a much higher level. 
And the uh, what is happening is in the year 2020, that particular growth is uh, sustained. So uh, what we are seeing is that uh, the growth growth would continue to grow and, and the new launches would sustain prices, whereas the old products would sustain that particular volume growth. And because of this, we can say the average prices would continue to remain at a higher level in the subsequent months. Now, when we're mentioning this, it's not just new product launches which is causing the effect. There's also a product mix effect. There are certain parts or certain segments which is causing this price increase. There's a product mix shift where you see certain high price segments like 5G smartphones spell, uh, selling at much higher rate than the total smartphone category. Or like ultra thin notebooks selling at double the growth rate of standard notebooks. This completely correlates with the consumer sentiment that they're ready to pay more for products that make their life easy. So consumers still have a certain part of disposable income in certain parts of the world where they couldn't spend on out-of-home activities like entertainment, leisure, etc. Now, when we are speaking about these aspects, let's also focus how does this reflect on the premium brands. And that's what I would like to point out next. When speaking about premium brands, the premium brands account for nearly 24% of total market. Now, how do you designate something as a premium brand? A premium brand is one which has the price index above that of a certain market average. What we have used as, as the benchmark here is a price index of 150. And what this means is, let's consider an example of vacuum cleaners in Singapore. Vacuum cleaners in Singapore, if the average sales price is a price index of 100, then anything selling at a price index of 150 would be considered premium. And this premium in Singapore would be very different from the premium in Germany. And similarly, we have classified anything which is falling in the bracket of price index between 75 to 150 as standard and anything between zero to 75 as entry level brands. Now, what we have seen is that the premium brands were the ones which were growing the most in comparison to the total market. And it registered a 32% growth globally. Major contributions for this is coming from tech-oriented sectors like IT office and telco. That's also because there is a certain affinity to a lot of performance-oriented aspects, which all, always come at a premium value. Not that it is not true for home appliances, be it MD and SDA, but that, that's more prevalent when the life cycle is short and it's more tech-oriented. So premium brands are continuing to grow globally and premiumization is a trend which is in vogue right now. It also points out where, uh, how we, uh, companies should pursue the strategy for premiumization. There is a certain question as to how to leverage that perfect, uh, perfectly across various, uh, at, at various points and for various products. It's not a one size fits all strategy. So uh, bearing this in mind, let's look at what else is in, a, in the offering. Right now, we see also pressures affecting the volume and prices. This is, uh, uh, this is data that is trickling in from our distribution panel. And here what we see is leading indications of volume deceleration. In the last year, we already saw volume decrease by 7% and prices increase by 7%. Coming into the first two months of this year, we have further seen that escalate and that disparity grow. You're seeing volume decelerate by 11% and the prices increase by another 10%. Kindly note that this is excluding the software part. So that is a very visible deceleration. Now, when we exclude software, you also have to mention that software, especially was growing in Western Europe. And in software, it was particularly the security and the storage part, which is growing the most. It could be because of the anticipation of cyber attacks, or it could be because of the anticipation of a potential conflict. So both of those, both of these aspects are also important. Now that we have spoken on the pricing aspect, on the premiumization aspect, the third most important thing right now to reflect that is the geopolitical situations of the world we currently live in. And with that in mind, this next picture is on the dynamics coming from the Russia-Ukraine situation. 
It's really unfortunate. However, right now at this point in time, quite understandably, JFK is not in a position to mention market dynamics in Ukraine. However, we see some dynamics coming in from our Russia panel. And what we see here is exactly what we were potentially expecting, that there would be a certain, uh, a certain immediate purchases that would trickle in. And the immediate purchases that we saw were big ticket items like MDA, IT, and telco. It is the high priced items or premium brands which are in high demand. Usually the products which are priced at thousand or more. And MDA products especially because they are usually high in price. Because of the uh, value deceleration of the currency, people are trying to get that converted into goods, potentially which can be converted back or resold at a later point. Because this purchases can only go to a certain point in time, we were already expecting a drop in the market. And quite so, in week 10, we are already seeing early signs of deceleration kicking in. The markets are already slumping, and the growth has decelerated across various sectors. Now, in this whole growth, quite like what I mentioned previously, it, there was a substantial increase for the premium products in the weeks eight and nine. However, that is slightly slumped in the last week that we saw. Now, when mentioning about the, the, the growth of brands, there is also certain brands which in the long run could potentially benefit from the current market dynamics. What we have seen is that a lot of European and US brands have actually pulled out. As a result, there is a certain void in the market which needs to be filled, as a result of which certain Korean brands were in high demand. From week 7 to week 10, we saw the market share increase from 23% to 31% in share. Same is the case for Chinese brands, which increased in share from 21% to 26%. So overall, this could result in certain unique dynamics in the long run, and certain regional brands could occupy a larger proportion of this market and could be leading players in the Russian market. With all that in mind, I'd like to now tap on a bit of collective wisdom and pick your brains on getting an idea of what is your price estimation for the price increases across various sectors in the year 2022. I'd wait for some uh, a minute till we get responses from all the attendees and we get to see an idea of what all of you expect as price increases. Still waiting for some responses as they trickle in. Yeah, I also see certain questions coming in, which uh, European markets are considered in tracking and which ones are considered for the price analysis. For the price analysis, we have considered all Google GFK track countries for the ASP tracking. For the time comparison on uh, shipping costs, we have used uh, the time period for month of March 22 versus the month of uh, versus the previous year same month, which is March 21. In terms of lead time, we have used December 21 versus December of 2020. And uh, there was also one question on which EU markets are included in the sales tracking. So that is all the European countries within GFK panel market, and you can potentially get in touch with our uh, sales colleagues to understand which exact markets. Otherwise, we, we, we have already mentioned those in the report that you would be getting by tomorrow. I hope I've answered the majority of the questions that we have. I'd wait for another 10 seconds, and then we would move on to the next part. C 
seems like we are nearly there. So I'd move on to the next slide. So in general, what all of you are stating is an expectation of six to 10% price increases for this year. Quite interesting. And that would also be interesting to think as to how discounting would work and how promotions would be in this year. With that, I'd like to hand over to Matthias to speak more on the consumer part and give some more insights on the consumer part. Thank you. Exactly. So um, this was more or less a, a general perspective of the entire market. So um, the product view, but it's likewise interesting to look also on the minds of these consumers on the different persons that are buying these things because they happen so much in these heads of in the end all of us we are all consumers we all made the experience that the last two years definitely were extraordinary so maybe start with a with a um, simple figure figure are consumers looking positive to their future and i guess uh, you guess it all they are rather not. 28%, that's more than one fourth of global consumers are not very confident about their economic future. That means in the next, uh, next year, in the next 12 months. And this share is rising. So 2020, it was 3% less. So a higher share of consumers are worried about their economic situation in the next 12 months. Vice versa, the shares of those who are positive about their economic future is 34%. It's just slightly more than those who are worried, 34%. And it's in particular striking if you consider that this score of those who were positive about the future was 41% in 2019. So we have a decrease from 41% to 34% during the times of COVID. Nevertheless, this is just an outlook. It's really volatile um, with the um, crisis in Ukraine right now. Um, people are just making up their mind in new. Um, so it goes up and down. People are more positive um, with the newest prognosis about uh, how COVID uh, incidences are developing. Then there happens something else. Confidence goes down again. It really goes up and down. So it's a really volatile score here. So my advice to all of you is like monitor closely what's happening there. The reality changes in a weekly base and a monthly base. It's really important to stay close to consumers to understand in each moment of time what is driving their thoughts, what are they doing. Just, just to give you an example what happened, and this is an example I think which is really close to us all, is the rise of the online channel. Right, we all were forced to lockdowns. Some stores in some countries, all stores, um, brick and mortar stores were closed down. So people had to use online. Some people also choose to go online for their purchases because they didn't want to go to store just for these, because they're afraid to infect um, with the virus and so on. Just give you some numbers around these because we're always kind of um, speaking theoretically about it. But you see right now, 35% of the e-commerce, 35% uh, um, is the share of e-commerce in the entire total tech and durable market. So more than a third of all tech and durable products that are sold worldwide in our panel markets, they go, uh, they're sold via e-commerce. This is an incredible growth, and you see it on this slide here in blue color. This is an incredible growth of 17% throughout the year from e-commerce. And many, many of my clients are asking me, Matthias, is it is it likely to stay? Um, what will happen in future? Are people going back to the stores once the crisis is over? And yeah, they will go to the store. It's quite likely they use stores. People like to go to stores. They like to go out. But to be honest, the online channel is here to stay. 63% of people are telling us right now they avoid to go to the store, but they're planning to continue in future. So it's more kind of parallel usage. and. Keep in mind, this is no new trend, right? So we're talking since since a decade or even more that the online channels are rising and the brick and mortar, the pure offline channels are decreasing. So COVID with its all side effect of lockdowns and so on, that was just an accelerator of a trend that already took place. But don't, um, 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 don't neglect the offline stores, as said before, people like to go there. But in the end, um, COVID did more to us than only changing our purchase, preferred purchase channel. It really changed the way what we are thinking. It really had an impact to our values, what we are doing and what we are wanting from our life, what we are wanting from our products. And when I'm speaking about values, when I'm speaking about my mindset, what I want from my life, this also applies to what I want from a brand, what a brand 
has to deliver. People are more and more conscious that brands reflect their own, the people, the consumers' own identity. I'm buying brands that I'm feeling fitting to me and my values. And never forget, all the consumers, they are watching what you're doing. This is a score from the US. 80% of consumers, 80% of consumers are saying that they are monitoring companies and that how a brand acts during a crisis impacts if they will buy from this brand in future. So they are really, the consumers are really aware to see if the company behaves in all aspects, in all aspects, not only in terms of being safe for the virus, but also how they deal with the employees and everything what, what's connected to it in the crisis. This defines how um, and if they want to buy it. Yeah, and what, what are these values? You know, that's, that's a tricky question. So what do consumers want from your life? And maybe we can start all um, with thinking on our own. I think we all are, and this is not just my guess, it's what we see in the data. We are all are more concerned about our personal health, on our personal safety. And this applies to more or less all people. The importance of being health and fit gained more importance across the globe for each and every one. We want our dear one, be healthy, be safe, be secure. So we also demand these aspects to be delivered from the products we used, right? So we're thinking more about contaminated food, for example. People are more than ever afraid of consuming contaminated food. Um, it's easy, right? It makes sense. But there are other really crucial side effects. For example, and I like I like this example a lot because I'm, I'm living downtown here um, um, in Nuremberg, Germany, and um, I have quite a crowded street with many cars in front of my house. And during the lockdown areas, there were no cars at all. The street belonged to the people. I could go out directly in front of my house, play soccer with my son on the street for the entire afternoon without any kind of um, um, car disrupting our pleasure. And this was also true for all our neighbors. So there was really kind of um, um, low level reclaiming the street, right? And that was a great feeling. And I'm pretty sure we all in this call have these examples. So COVID triggered, at least for me, and we see it in our data that it applies to many people, um, a kind of new relation to our environment. And I heard some from, from some uh, colleagues from India that some Indian people um, from some Indian region, they could see the Himalaya mountains for years because there was no smog, there was no air pollution, because um, the air was cleaner. And people are really started thinking about this entire nature thing. And nature, I'm not only talking about environment friendliness, but the complete large area of sustainability. And this is why all these aspects became so important of consumers' minds. And um, if you think about, yeah, that's important of consumers' mind, does it affect any kind of any kind of um, purchasing behavior? Yeah, it does, right? 62% of consumers globally, and this is two thirds, and this is a large chunk of people. Think about how many heads are behind this tiny figure. 62% say they're willing to change their purchase habits to um, help reduce environment impact. And they don't uh, want even more. And this is a quite a funny score at the, at the right hand corner. Even more of them, 77%, uh, a large chunk of consumers, a large chunk, they expect companies to act in an environmentally responsible way. So they want and this is where, where, where it's get interesting for brands, for manufacturers, for retailers. They want companies to take care for what they don't want to do, they can't do. They want not be fully responsible for changing their life. They want companies to help these. And this is linked for a general trend we all experience all the time. That's mental convenience, right? We all want to invest as little energy as possible in whatever we do in life in purchasing and thinking about it. So if we can ask somebody else to take care for something which is important for me, I'm happy to do so. And I'm also happy to pay money for these. We see that 50% of consumers are willing to pay a brand premium, a premium price for these kind of services, right? So they are willing to pay more if you take care for what's important for them. I think this is really a crucial message. And to be honest, we're talking mainly about tech durables industry right here. If I look at other industries, for, uh, for example, fast moving consumer goods, they are far, they are, they're more ahead in this topic. So the um, tech and durable industry is kind of lacking behind when it comes to some of these aspects, but it's such an important industry 
for the consumers right now during the lockdowns in general, as Nevin said, we had a large growth in many categories because consumers were buying so many technical things for their homes during the lockdown period. You see the growth rates for different categories here on the screen, right? Entertainment and health, eat at home and so on. They are all growing a lot by average 15% across many categories. So why is that? Yeah, makes sense, right? Because consumers had to build a full-fledged home office. They couldn't go to the cinema anymore, to the theater, so they upgraded um, an entertainment area. Um, they couldn't go to the to the pool, to the spa area, so they built a kind of upgraded spa at home. They built a restaurant-style kitchen. They really used all these tech devices to upgrade their home. And this is a trend that will last. We recently did a social media poll, the figures here on the right, left, left-hand um, um, corner. 65% said, yeah, I, I don't want to go full-time back to office. I will not. I just go one to four days, and there's a kind of kind of focus on, on let's say, two to three days in the data. So this trend will definitely continue. And maybe it's worthwhile to dig deeper into one of these categories, maybe the biggest one, core wearables, plus 79%. That's, that's almost double, I'd like to say, um, plus 79%. And this is not because people want to check their messages on their, on, their, on their watch. This is also due to this kind of mental shift that happened in consumers' minds. It's because of staying healthy. As said before, two out of three consumers say it's very important it's crucial it's one of the most important things in their life to be in mental and physical good shape and they are using these smart watches and these other wearable products um, to to monitor the calories burned to monitor the amount of sleep and the quality of sleep the number of steps and so on they're doing using other products as well to to to, to measure um, blood oxygen levels so in the end this entire area is so much rising this entire self um, um, optimization fitness monitoring area due to the change in consumers mindsets so these were a lot of figures nevin and me um, um, showed you today and many bits of pieces we'd like to um, conclude today's session with a kind of summary of all these bits and pieces into four general strategies so these are um, um, nevin and mine thoughts how to approach all these challenges in the current market uh, conditions. I'd like to start with omnichannel. We saw online is important, offline will not vanish um, at all, and consumers will switch back and forth between the channels. So omnichannel is definitely key. You see 57% of these Gen Z and millennials generations, these are the more younger people um, who directly have more money. They're in the midst of their, of their career, so they will shop tech and durable products both online and offline. And this is also reflected in what we call ROPO scores. You see it here on the left-hand corner down. ROPO means research a product online, purchase offline, or vice versa. So um, the persons who bought in a certain channel, online or offline, half of them use the other channel to research a product. So 51% persons, percent of those who purchased the product online, they went any store or to any offline channel to make up their mind and vice versa 45 percent of offline buyers researched online so from consumer perspective it's not about online or offline it's really about no line at all they don't think in channels anymore they think in omnichannel they think in most frictionless shopping experience ever because as i said before mental convenience i do not want to bother with different channels i just want to use what's on my hand and i want to have it as frictionless as possible and in this regard, let me point out one thing, and this is what I call the dual role of retailers. So never ever think about retailers to be only checkout channels, right? People are buying at retailers, of course, but people, consumers, are using retailers as important information channels. You see it here on the slide now, 40% of, um, um, of all tech and durables consumers globally use an offline stores information channel. So also those people, who are going online, buying online, 40% of all go to an offline store to make up their mind, not as a checkout, just to make up their mind. And 29%, that's a third of all persons globally bought a tech and jewels product, they're using kind of online re uh, online retailer as information channel. So they get to Amazon, check uh, prices, check reviews, check uh, check specs. They go to Dyson's D, uh, D, uh, UK and check check several things. So they're really into all these um, channels at once. 
and why are they choosing a kind of um, certain retailer? This is also on the slide here, a part of price that it's obvious, they go for stock availability because I want, if I go researching a product, I want to find this product into, in, in the store. So this is really a crucial thing. It's about stock availability. It's about convenience and have a great user experience, easy to navigate in the stores, because this is why people are choosing stores also as an information channel. So my advice to you, have the dual role in, in, in your head always. Don't be there. Don't be only there where people make the checkout, but be in particular at the retailers where people make up their mind. Second strategy kind of ties into these and into the different mindsets of consumers. We saw there's a broad change, a change in values and the change in values, what we value, this is really a deep change in us, right? It's not just kind of behavioral change or, or whatever, which, which, which is really kind of volatile. These value changes, they are deep rooted in us. They will stay. They are really hard to change. And um, from a researcher perspective, I'm quite, quite interested in this entire COVID situation right now because we do not experience such huge impacts in our lives a lot. Um, I think if you ask me five years ago, if I think that mindsets and values would change, I would say, well, we have maybe in the next 10 or 20 years. So it, it's really, it needs a hard, hard cut in our lives that we change our values. But this unfortunately means that all consumer segmentations we're using, grouping of consumers, they are not valid anymore. So definitely rethink your consumer segmentations in the slide of this new situation we have right now. That can be used for better messaging, for example, for better product positioning, what do consumers want right now? And um, also in terms of promotion, of course, and um, just ties more and better and more focused into consumer needs. So um, we put it on the slide a bit catchy, a lifestyle as a platform for solutions. So think about different lifestyles consumers have different lifestyle segments as a springboard for what you do in future and always check them and always up to them, update them. Don't work with segmentations that are five years ago, um, old. They are not valid anymore in the new reality. And this more or less feeds into the third strategy. Think about branding. Um, we saw that um, more consumers are have higher demands on brands. They have, want to have their personality reflected in a brand. So build a strong identity, uh, brand identity around your products that definitely resonates with consumers and thus drives a premium. And these scores you find here on the slides, they come from a statistical analysis. So we looked and spoke with consumers and statistically determined the drivers of brand premium. So what are the factors? Is this really statistically drive consumers um, buying premium products. And it's quality, it's being different, it's, and this is in the top three, right? It's fitting to my values and brand attachment feeling close to the brand. So make sure that your brand is delivering these aspects because consumers are more and more picky. And to be honest, again, um, we're talking about tech durables today. Uh, many fast moving consumer brands are more more advanced in this regards with um, being a strong brand, building up a strong branding that has reasons, um, that has reasons that make sense because many consumers think more about um, um, the larger ticket sizes or higher prices. They pay for tech and durables products. So also companies are focusing more on tech and, uh, in the tech durable industry, on features, on quality and all these things. But in the end, um, when it comes to when it comes to all the things um, Nevin said earlier, right? Um, the the volume not growing that stronger anymore with disruptions in the in the um, 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 distribution and the higher costs that go with it. It's definitely worthwhile to consider if you can can get a premium out of the consumers um, by building a really strong brand. So my advice to you: definitely be clear on your vision, be bold, fit to the values, but don't be too bold. Always check what appeals to the total population. It doesn't help you to be bold in a kind of niche sector. And and this is really important in my daily work here at GFK, find out what are the best assets for you right now. Don't put everything just on Facebook. Don't put everything just on TV. Really find your individual best mix to invest in the assets. And this is ti directly tied to what I said before, to your target segments. 
Thank you, Matthias. And with the fourth, I come back again, and it is more on the focus on key trends. And key trends are always main drivers. And let me start. There are three key trends that I'd reiterate, which would be significant for this year. The first being the health, hygiene, and well-being focus. Health has been a growing fo a concern for the consumers and offers a great opportunity for brands and retailers. Right now, what we have seen is that uh, during the COVID period, products like oximeters or, uh, or, or thermometers were in quite high demand. Now, COVID put a spotlight on the greater health awareness topic, and now that remains, because of which there is a greater awareness to monitor things. And it's also contributing to the busy lifestyle with, that comes with urbanization. And more and more people want to opt more for the preventive strategies than go only for treatment strategies. And that's where the growth for core wearables and blood pressure monitors comes into play. Now, don't be confused about the 79 and 42 that you see here, because the 42 percent that we see here is particularly for the health and fitness trackers and for the smart watches. Uh, at the same time, you also see certain health products like water filters, which help address certain environmental problems or environmental conditions or macro conditions. So all in all, consumers are again resonating with the fact that they are looking for products and services that would help them live a healthy life. And probably thinking on those lines would be beneficial for both the brands and stocking such on the shelf would be also beneficial for the retailers. Second important one is a, a keyword which is very much in the media these days, sustainability. Sustainability as a key driver is gaining ground. However, its significance across various sectors is quite different. Now, let's take an example of energy efficiency as a buying criterion across various sectors. It's most significant for major appliances because of the usage frequency daily or weekly in comparison to, say, a consumer electronics product or a small appliances product. Now, because of that, it is quite prevalent that when you're buying a major appliance product, the energy efficiency is of highest importance. And that is quite visible in the numbers. In terms of IT and offices, it's more oriented with packaging uh, and, and, and certain other aspects of delivery where they are trying to trickle in more of the sustainability aspect at this point in time. However, the need of the R for the brands, as, as Matthias was previously saying, is to focus on values and values which resonate with the consumer's values. So hence, brands have to be more purpose-driven now, even more. And it's not just important to be purpose-driven, but also make people aware about what your purpose is and get out there in front of the consumer. Because sometimes you could be already doing those aspects, but there's no awareness of what you're doing amongst the consumers. Hence, creating a greater awareness is important. And that's where I'd like to tie in the aspect that 71% of consumers now feel that it's important that consumers, uh, companies take environmentally friendly actions. Now, taking an example from MDA, we have taken a look at a new insight developed in GFK Neuron, which is the, uh, the percentage of brands considered as eco-friendly. And out of the brands that consumers bought, we saw that only 1.6 out of the top 10 of the 10 brands bought were considered as eco-friendly within the washing machines criteria. 1.6 is a very low number, but it also points out to the opportunity that lies in offering. And that's what we want to point out. Be the first mover in that space. Make people, uh, uh, make consumers more and more aware. And that can only add to you being more trusted brands and resonating more with their values. And last but not the least is the aspect of performance. And one of the major use cases of performance is the aspect of multifunctionality, which is growing in home appliances these days. Now, there are multiple reasons why multifunctionality is growing. And it is not a one size fits all uh, uh, kind of kind of uh, strategy. Here you see multifunctionality growing because of ma many reasons. More and more people living in cities and urbanization coming as a result of which the living spaces are getting smaller. And a uh, result of which you would see that people would try to optimize on the space at their, in their home. This is also relevant very much regionally and per product. Now, case in point is looking at dynamics of, say, individual categories like rice cookers, bread makers, which were in decline, or the minuscule growth that was for food steamers. Not saying that these categories won't rebound, but 
when you look at uh, these categories in comparison with the electrical cooking pot, electrical cooking pot with rice cooking functions were in a growth of 11%, with steaming function 6%, and with baking 1%. So overall, the multifunctionality is one aspect because of which the electrical cooking pot is in high demand. Same is the case with washing machine and tumble dryers, both of which are growing categories, but wash dryers are in quite high demand. So overall, it could be quite different for different regions and for different product categories. And in some cases, what consumers could be potentially looking is for that small incremental cost resulting in more functionality and saving space. And as I said, it's not a one size fits all and would need to be tailored per category, per country. With that, I'd like to uh, conclude on the part of the strategies and reiterate some of the points that we have raised today, which are the five major takeaways that we have for you. First, think seamlessly in terms of consumer journey. It's not either online or offline. It's frictionless. You have to consider omni-channel strategies now in the post-COVID era. Second, build on data-rich con consumer personas that reflect the state of the new normal. Rethinking segmentations could be one of the things, just as Matthias was citing. Third, target the con connected consumer with high-performance aspects like smart, multifunctional, because consumers are looking for higher perceived value. And it is those higher perceived value products which would add higher revenue for the brands or higher mar margin for the brands and increase your revenue for per shelf space. Fourth, fuel the premiumization to bolster the margin. Currently, that would be a major strategy to look at in this year with the demand deceleration, the, the premiumization can offset that and help with the margins. However, premiumization is a strategy that is not for all brands, and hence you need to actually consider it per brand or per product or based on specific regions. And finally, go bold, look at brand loyalty and look at what are the aspects that consumers relate to. And last but not the least is strike out on that sustainability. Reap the benefits of being a first mover in sustainability and by giving really credible value adds to the consumers and also communicating to them to create, generate more awareness about your green actions. So that's about it. And you can read more in the report that we have published and look at these insights in greater detail. Now, with that, I'd like to conclude and take up some of the questions that we have been seeing trickling into the chat. There was one question which was uh, particularly about consumer confidence and how does that particularly relate to uh, how does that particularly relate to the overall sales. We're already seeing in Jan and Feb that consumer confidence was uh, consumer confidence was on a state of decline, and right now that completely correlates with the deceleration that we are seeing. There are certain supply chain issues uh, which affect especially the tech sectors, but also certain other sectors, be it home appliances. So we are certainly seeing a certain correlation between a declining consumer confidence and also deceleration in terms of volume. Second was the question on online numbers for Europe and for the world. For the global, it is 35%, and for Europe, it is standing at 41% share. So that is also something that is growing. And uh, the other questions... There are some specific questions on, on, on single markets um, that might be not that interesting for the entire group here. We will get back to you later on these. I sent you some information. Um, let's go through these. What, what, what else came? Um, I think the most questions have already been answered. Um, let us come back to you here. I think time is already kind of, kind of um, running up. So um, we, um, Nevin and me, or the other um, um, chief K colleagues will get back to you with your question and um, answer them in the next days at the most. Thank you.